So finally, Robert Mueller has completed a special investigation into the alleged Trump-Russia collusion. And surprise, surprise, there was no collusion. The Democrats and the media, of course, are hugely disappointed. They spent two years talking about this like it was proven fact. Now, it's been interesting to watch CNN and MSNBC and other major news networks that espouse this narrative for two years, see how they walk this back. And so far, it seems like they're just trying to deflect off of the fact that they reported this as proven fact, the collusion. And they're kind of hoping that people will forget about that, that it will go die a slow, quiet death off to the side. And instead, now they're focusing on the whole obstruction of justice narrative because Mueller didn't draw a conclusion whether Trump attempted to uh, obstruct justice. So that's going to become their narrative now. They're going to go on and on about that, that Trump got away with something. And to be honest, they have to do that. They have to, one, deflect away from the fact that they reported incorrectly for two years. And they also need to take the attention away from the idiots that are on the presidential hopeful list for the Democratic Party. The attention goes on to that, and the American people are going to realize how absolutely idiotic the Democratic Party is. I mean, if you look at the list of people running for a presidential nomination, their collective IQ would not be enough to pass grade 5 math. You got Beto O'Rourke, who went to New Mexico and ate dirt, literally soil. Not one accomplishment, and he eats dirt, and admits that he eats dirt, because dirt has special powers, and he brings it home to his family to eat dirt. <laughs> he also once allegedly put poop from his child's diaper in a bowl, gave it to his wife and said it was avocado. Not only would I not vote for that guy, I wouldn't eat at his house. And there's Cory Booker, who believes that Americans need to be nudged towards accepting fake cheese. It smells <laughs> awful. Nah. Oh. Oh, no. Mm. Oh, the consistency is terrible. Yes, fake cheese. Because the greenhouse gases that are produced by the dairy industry are unsustainable. Now, with that great piece of policy, he probably attracted two votes from the two people that actually know what fake cheese is. Have you ever heard of fake cheese? Why would you eat fake cheese? Good luck trying to get that into the Paris Accord or the Paris Agreement on Climate. The French would back out of that. Don't touch my fromage. Then you got Elizabeth Warren, who spent years claiming she was Native American. Trump calls her out, names her Pocahontas, and she says, I'll show you, Trump. I'm going to get a DNA test done. The DNA test comes back and shows that she's whiter than white, maybe had a Native American ancestor like eight generations ago. She thinks it exonerates her, puts it out for public opinion. And people now are looking at her like she's a complete idiot. And when they ask her about it, she blames her family for lying to her. And then there's Christian Gillibrand, who in a speech on the weekend told the crowd, He puts his name on bold on every building. He does this because he wants you to believe he is strong. No, Kirsten. He puts his names on buildings because that's his brand. I wonder if she's ever looked at a Hilton hotel and wondered why the name Hilton's on the side. Do you think Conrad Hilton put his name on the side of hotels because he wants people to think he's strong? No, it's his last name and he named his company after that. I work for a family-owned company. They named their company after their last name. Their name is on everything. Not because they want to tell people they're strong. That's the name of their company. That's how they brand it. Now on the topic of Trump's brand, that's my awkward segue away from the conversation on Kirsten Gillibrand and the other Democratic presidential hopefuls. I really only brought those up so that I could go through to Kirsten Gillibrand, talk about her comment on Trump's brand, and then go into the real topic I want to talk about, which is Trump and his unique relationship to his own brand. Because I think if you understand Trump and his brand, what he says and does as a president will make a whole lot more sense to you. So what is a brand? Well, a brand is a whole lot more than a company's name on a building or its logo. A brand is all the things that the company name brings to your mind when you hear it. So you can think of a brand as the personality of an organization or a business, and that personality needs to shine through in everything that company does or says. Now consider the Trump brand, and I would argue that the Trump's brand is completely unique from all other brands in North America and maybe even in the world. When you see the name Hilton on a hotel, you probably think of hotels and maybe a certain quality of hotel, but you probably don't think of Conrad Hilton, the man that started the chain. But with Trump's brand, 
it really can't be separated from Trump the man. He's the personification or the embodiment of the Trump brand. Actually, more than that, I would say he is the Trump brand. Long before Trump became president, he was a household name. He was enshrined in pop culture. I think there's 200 popular songs that have his name in them. A lot of them are hip-hop songs where he's an icon and a symbol of success, swagger, and wealth. So his brand evokes those thoughts. Wealth, power, prestige, boldness, brashness. He's over the top. He's unapologetically so. The Trump name was on the side of helicopters, buildings, hotels, golf courses, steaks, bottled water, and even wine. And when you heard the name of Trump, you never really pictured those products. You pictured the man, slightly orange, crazy hair. And that's no accident because Trump carefully cultivated his brand and what that brand stood for. In the 1980s, a man named John Barron began calling the New York Times and a reporter at the New York Times claiming he was a spokesperson for Donald Trump. And he would brag up Trump's wealth, Trump's greatness. He put positive spins on narratives about Trump, talking about how successful his business ventures were. And then in the 1990s, there was a man named John Miller who did the same thing, calling up the press and saying how great Trump was, no one's better. Well, it was really Trump. Trump was playing his own spokesperson and really bragging himself up. He started cultivating that image of a bold, brash, successful businessman. He was a shameless self-promoter, and he never wavered away from the key messages of the Trump brand. Trump was the greatest, the wealthiest, the best businessman ever. So Trump and his brand, long before he became president, was well established. And he never goes off of his brand. It took years to create it, and he continues to cultivate it. So whether you like or dislike the Trump brand, he is very good at brand management. Because if a company wants to maintain a strong brand, they have to be very intentional about how they manage it. It has to be presented consistently, and it needs to stay true to its core message. So if a brand, if a brand brings to you brings to your mind the idea of strength, you can never have that brand demonstrate any weakness because it goes against the main point of what that brand is. The brand always has to be on message and on point. And branding is very important in the business world because people aren't rational buyers. They're not rational consumers. They don't just look at price and quality. Their perception of the brand they're looking at has a huge role in their purchase decision. And with Trump, his brand is everything. He's made his living off of it. And whether you like it or not, he brought that brand into the presidency. So if you ever wonder why when Trump gets caught in a lie or an exaggeration, or if he makes a spelling mistake in a tweet, he doesn't apologize or correct, he often doubles down on it. You ever wonder why that is? It's because that's his brand. He's never wrong. He's always the greatest. He's bold, brash, and unapologetic. Remember his inauguration? Trump claimed he had the greatest crowds ever. Now that statement was demonstrably false. I think Obama had a far bigger crowd, but Trump stuck to that narrative because Trump is the greatest. He can never let his brand be anything other than what it's known to be. He stays on that message again and again and again. That's his brand. Now imagine for a moment if Trump's spring water, so he has a bottled water brand called Trump spring water, imagine it became contaminated with arsenic and a number of people died. Do you think Trump would apologize or would he say something like this? No other product has killed people more effectively. It was unbelievably deadly. Mr. President, it killed people. I know. And it killed them so, so very quickly. They say nothing ever in this history of the world has killed so quickly or so effectively. And that's because Trump's brand can never admit defeat. It doesn't matter what happens. The Trump name, the Trump brand, Trump himself must always be the greatest. He is the Trump brand. And like any company with a solid brand strategy, he never goes off point, ever. A brand is hard to build, but it's even harder to rebuild. So having said all that, I'm not suggesting for a moment that Trump is right in what he does. But I think if you understand that Trump is his brand and that he is always on brand, it can help you understand why he never admits wrong and why everything he does, he, he insists is the biggest, greatest, and like no other. And that's my position on Trump's brand.